Thank you, Hugh. Um, I'll um, save my acknowledgments to the end and say a few words about uh, the center, but um, I uh, appreciate having the opportunity to share the virtual stage with the other speakers today. Uh, if I can have the first slide. Uh, the problem with a 20 minute talk is that you do injustice to the background and in a topic like CH functionalization, there is a lot of background to cover, but I'll just briefly say that the way we view the world of CH functionalization these days is sort of in three bins, um, three flavors of CH functionalization, uh, one that involves the transfer of electrophilic atoms like carbenes, nitrines, and oxines, uh, and, and even more recently, uh, uh, halogen-directed CH functionalization. Uh, the other, um, I'd say, uh, tactic for functionalizing CH bonds was, was beautifully uh, demonstrated in the previous talk by Matt, where palladium uh, in particular is used to direct uh, CH insertion and to form organometallic uh, species. And then the third area is, of course, biocatalysis. And in the center, this is represented by David Sherman and, and, uh, and Jared Lewis, uh, both the, um, the application of, of uh, I would say, directed evolution methods to evolve um, enzymes, uh, as well as the notion of ins installing artificial cofactors into enzyme active sites and using the power of small molecule chemistry along with the directing ability of a protein to, um, to augment CH bonds. I think this is obviously in a very exciting area that's, uh, that's really um, seeing, uh, I think, rapid growth um, uh, in, in the last few years. So uh, in my lab, you know, we've been interested for now a number of years in, in atom transfer catalysis, transferring both nitrines and oxines to CH bonds. And uh, to make a long story short, um, standing on the shoulders of some original work from Ron Breslow, uh, we found conditions to, um, that really sort of emulated the, the beautiful work that Davies and Doyle uh, and, and Tabor had shown with carbene transfer reactions, and that's really on the next slide. Um, you can see a number of different heterocycles now that we can generate through what is effectively an intramolecular nitrine CH insertion reaction. And one of the ways that this chemistry was really advanced uh, was through the advent of a novel rhodium complex uh, known as rhodium ESP. Uh, it's a strapped um, dicarboxylate ligand, and two of those strap a rhodium core. And that ligand, that complex turns out to be quite robust and allows us to engage a number of different um, oxidized nitrogen substrates in this intramolecular pro process. Now, oh, um, I would say in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a number of advances in nitrine CH insertion reactions, uh, um, some beautiful examples of cobalt catalyzed uh, insertion, as well as uh, silver mediated reactions of this sort. If there's one advantage to rhodium, uh, I'd say it's the substrate scope and the, the breadth of different um, starting materials that one can use to make these kinds of heterocycles. So this has been a, you know, again, a, a long-standing problem in my group, and uh, and these days I think we're really sort of targeted at finding clever ways of applying these technologies to making natural products and really demonstrating for the wider world how one thinks about using amination chemistry in the context of natural product synthesis. But there has been another long-standing problem in my lab, and that's really shown on the next slide. Uh, and this was really uh, brought to fore um, when we started the center now some eight or nine years ago. Uh, we've been very fortunate in the center to have a number of wonderful partnerships, not only with other academic labs, but also with industrial labs like Novartis, uh, one of the original um, industrial sponsors. And then subsequent to that, we've, we've added a number of other companies um, that have uh, engaged with us. But Novartis threw down what was really an incredible challenge to us, and that is how do we take these active pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, which are part of their large compound library, and modify these um, through oxidative catalysis. And as you can see from the structures at the top of the slide, I mean, these are really complicated molecules with a number of polar functional groups that, uh, that really, I would say, represent the extreme end of difficulty for the kinds of atom transfer CH functionalization that my lab and others are trying to do. The value of being able to oxidize these kinds of compounds though is potentially quite large. And I think this is best sort of exemplified in the work by Cravat and Romo, where using a, a modified version of one of our reaction conditions, they're able to take um, natural products um, and, uh, and show that in a single step, you could incorporate a carbon nitrogen substituent and from there, 
make uh, affinity probes and or other types of modified natural products, which would, of course, uh, change the biological activity of these, these molecules. So again, for the longest time, we have been now focused on trying to develop robust reaction processes that would allow us to modify the kinds of molecules that are shown on this slide. And when we started this work, and this is on the next slide now, um, we, uh, we were fortunate that uh, with the advent of rhodium ESP, we were able to show that uh, we could indeed get reasonable levels of, of, of oxidized products, starting with simple benzylic substrates, uh, using a nitrogen source that could not oxidize itself, and that's shown as the trichloroethoxy sulfonamide on the left. Um, and one of the most important features of this reaction is that we were using a single equivalent of the substrate. Um, prior uh, to this work, you know, most of the literature that described these kinds of oxidation processes re really had to rely on large excesses of substrate. And of course, that's fine if your starting material is ethyl benzene, but if you're trying to oxidize something that's more complicated and more precious to you, you, you'd really like to use that as the limiting reagent. So we've always held our feet to the fire and tried to ensure that the reactions that we're developing here, again, uh, rely on using limiting amounts of substrate. So as I mentioned, uh, benzylic substrates turned out to be reasonable, reasonable for this process, but what failed, unfortunately, was really the oxidation of tertiary substrates. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. The other thing that was revealed from this, this chemistry was, 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 I think, of, of great mechanistic um, value. And that is that uh, a small byproduct was isolated, and that's the aziridine that's highlighted in blue. And the only way that aziridine forms, to our mind, is if uh, somehow the pivalic acid that's generated as a byproduct in this reaction is oxidized to isobutylene. And this was a this was a really interesting find um, by Kristen Fiore Williams, and uh, and 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 led us to to drill deeper into the mechanism of this process. Next slide. So um, what I can tell you is that when you mix the reagents and catalyst and oxidant, you find that the color of these solutions changes rather rapidly from the beautiful blue green solution of the rhodium dimer to a red complex. And it turns out that that red complex was characterized many years ago by my late colleague, Henry Talby, and it is definitively a rhodium 2,3 dimer, so where one electron has been removed from the dirhodium core. And you can see that very obviously in the, in the, in the, in the spectroscopic um, data that I show on this slide. Our work and, and subsequent to that, John Berry's work um, characterized this rhodium dimer uh, being formed under the reaction conditions. And to John's credit, they, they recognized that the axial ligand bound to the rhodium is the anionic form of the trichloroethoxy sulfonamide um, ligand. And so it's that complex that's generated when you mix all of the reaction components. What's really interesting to note, if you click on the next slide or on the animation, is that that red color, um, um, that that red complex, I should say, can be reduced rather easily with the added zinc. And it turns out that another reducing agent for this red complex, next slide or next click, is um, pivalic acid. So pivalic acid serves as a reducing agent for this 2,3 dimer. And that, of course, provides a, a, a way of, of at least rationalizing the first step in isobutylene formation. All of this, of course, is, is, has been informative and, and, uh, and I should say uh, has, again, um, gotten us starting to think about whether there might be a role for both the rhodium 2,2 and the 2,3 species under the actual reaction conditions. And so next slide shows that, um, in fact, there were some strange phenomenological differences between reactions that were run now as intermolecular processes versus those that had been run intramolecularly. When we run intermolecular reactions using this simple isoamyl benzene substrate, we find that benzylic, oxi benzylic oxidation is favored over tertiary oxidation. But that is not the case when we run intramolecular competition experiments um, under effectively the same conditions, we find that indeed it's tertiary CH bonds that react preferentially. So that was really sort of an odd, odd observation that we've puzzled over for, for many years now. The second observation, uh, next slide, is that the kinetic isotope effect for the intra versus the intermolecular process is quite a bit different as well. And again, these data and the ones I showed you on the previous slide have led us to speculate the role of possibly two different catalysts, um, 
and two different oxidizing species. Next slide. And that's shown here. Um, the idea that, in fact, um, the rhodium-2,2 nitrine may be one oxidant, but there may also be chemistry out of a rhodium-2,3 dimer um, as well, and that these may have different modes by which they react. Um, th this, this is sort of the, the question that has um, now vexed us for some time. So um, through our engagement with the center, it's been wonderful to, to work with both experimentalists and computational chemists. Um, John Barry and, and Jamal Musayev have engaged with us to explore the question of whether the 2,3 dimer is really a viable uh, oxidant. If you click on the next slide, um, the calculations that have been done uh, do indeed support the idea that the rhodium-2,3 nitrine could be a, 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 an oxidant of uh, CH bonds, uh, that the, in fact the barrier for CH insertion is quite low. What is particularly intriguing about this um, computational work is that the, the way one wants to think about the rhodium-2,3 dimer is really as a rhodium-2,2 dimer with a nitrine radical cation attached, um, truly what I would call a hyper-reactive electrophile. And so um, I think what, what this theoretical work does, you know, is really, um, it gives wind to our sails that in fact we're, 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 we feel like we're thinking about the problem correctly in, in um, in looking at this as sort of a, a, a two different oxidation state or two different catalysts, two different reactive catalyst model. So, um, but again, experimentally, this is a very challenging problem to, to, to dive into. And here's where, again, our collaborations through the center have been particularly invaluable. So um, on the next slide, um, working with my colleague and, and dear friend, Dick Zare, uh, we've been able to use the power of mass spec and bring that to bear to study reaction mechanism. And what um, Graham Cooks and, and, and Dick Zare realize is that, that, that this ambient um, desorption method called uh, DESI mass spec is, is really a, a fantastic way. And Dick's insight here was to realize that you could actually run reactions in the spray, if you will, of a mass spec and capture um, uh, short-lived intermediates in secondary micro droplets, which you could then um, uh, in effect, sweep up into the bore of a mass spec and and determine molecular ions. Now, I think you know any experimentalist will be the first to agree that that spraying a supersonic jet of solvent containing reagents at a catalyst that's on a on a on a cover slip is is not a round bottom flask. But I think the the power of this method is that you get out tremendous information. Um, all of the possible analytes that might form are sort of reflected in that in that, that, that mass spectrum. And so the job of the experimentalist, of course, is to take that information and then go back and try to convince oneself that, that some, if not all, of these different analytes are in fact relevant to the, to the bulk scale reaction. So on the next slide, you can see that uh, indeed what mass spec has done for us, what DESI mass spec has done for us is to confirm many of our suspicions by being able to capture at least molecular ions that are reflective of the different intermediates I show. But one of the most intriguing uh, finds was that of the, of the rhodium dimer that has attached to it now the anionic form of the sulfamate um, ligand, that, that, um, that same species I mentioned earlier. And that's shown at the bottom of this slide. And what we were able to do using um, this DESI mass spec method was to simply switch from methylene chloride to deuterated methylene chloride. Next slide, please. And show that, um, in fact, the, um, the formation of this, this anionic sulfamate, sulfamate complex was really the result of um, CH abstraction of solvent. And that's, I think, very clear from these experiments, where one simply changes from methylene chloride to deuterated methylene chloride. And you can see that there is, in fact, a, a change in the molecular ion by a, a single unit. So um, this was, uh, I think, a particularly rewarding set of experiments. But again, you know, uh, the, the challenge is, is, is to understand, uh, in our minds, um, how does this CH abstraction reaction, um, does it relate to the bulk experiment, uh, um, the bulk solution experiment? And ultimately, how is this related to um, the diminution in, in catalyst activity or loss in turnover number? And how can we use this information to really improve the, the, the catalytic performance. So along with these data, we've been puzzling for a long time. Next slide, please. Over um, 
what is really the role of the sixth ligand as we like to characterize it in my lab. And what I mean by that is when you think about these rhodium species, whether it's the 2,2 nitrine or the 2,3 nitrine, there is in principle uh, another ligand and that ligand is bound to the second rhodium ion, the distal rhodium, if you will. And the role of that ligand in influencing the chemistry of the nitrine is um, presumably profound because it's, it's certainly well known in these rhodium complexes that, that, that one ligand binding event can have both a trans influence as well as a trans effect on the second ligand binding event. But the problem is that in a typical reaction that we run, especially one that's run in methylene chloride, we really have no clue what that sixth ligand is. And we have no good way of really controlling that. We've thought about different ways of doing that through various ligand designs, but we've been pretty much thwarted in, in those attempts. And so the, the way we really have tried to think about um, predetermining, if you will, what that sixth ligand is, is to simply say, okay, well, what if we chose a solvent that is coordinating could we assume that just the fact that the solvent is in gross excess relative to all, all the other reagents, could we assume that that solvent would be um, bound most of the time, if not all of the time, to that distal rhodium center? So next slide, please. Um, so um, in, in thinking about other solvents, we've known for some time, and this is really work that came out of the Amgen lab some years ago, that isopropyl acetate had been an effective solvent for intramolecular CH amination. And for, for many years, we used it, isopropyl acetate in the lab for intermolecular amination as well. And you can see that under a standard set of conditions now where we're using a, phenoxy, a phenol-derived sulfamate and uh, isopropyl acetate, we can get about 40% yield of the aminated um, menthol product. But what we'd like to do is, of course, use um, more polar solvents, so those with a, a higher dipole moment, which we think would be stronger um, coordinating ligands. And we've looked at that, and next slide, please. And what you'll see is that the, the obvious uh, solvents that you would choose, dimethylformamide or dimethyl sediment, are all deleterious to reaction performance. And I think that makes good sense to us that these particular solvents may just be so strongly coordinating that they block any uh, access to both rhodium sites. At least that had been our, our thinking for some time and had sort of dissuaded us from trying other polar solvents. But um, fortunately, uh, Nick Ciappini um, was bold enough to try uh, a few more solvents. Next slide, please. Uh, including solvents like sulfalane and propylene carbonate, uh, looking again at acetonitrile, which we had known for some time had always been a marginal solvent, and again, seeing at least a, a slight bounce in reaction performance. But ultimately, it's when he tried the final solvent, uh, next slide, t-butyl nitrile, that we saw a, a rather dramatic improvement in um, the overall product yield. And this was, uh, of course, a great day for us in the lab. This is um, for this particular substrate, which I would argue is kind of a uh, medium difficulty, uh, seeing an 85% yield of the product uh, is, uh, is really a, a, a terrific result in our mind. Uh, the next slide shows um, very briefly just the sort of substrate scope with a, a few of the more complicated substrates that we've been looking at. Again, I'll just remind everybody that the, this, these yields are all reported with one equivalent of starting material. So um, uh, you run this reaction once and, and, and these are the yields that you isolate. If anybody's interested in amino cialis, um, call us up. Um, the reactions are exquisitely clean. I'll just have you power through the next slide, Dan. Um, but that's one of the real beautiful features of the amination chemistry is that we don't see a lot of over-oxidation. So we're getting really quantitative conversion to, we're getting either, you know, product plus starting material recovered. In, in, and, and that's really the way most of these reactions um, proceed. Next slide, please. So um, one of the things I, I mentioned early was the challenge that Novartis had, had sort of thrown down, which is could we oxidize these nitrogen-rich containing uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients? And I'm happy to say that being able to work now in polar solvents allows us to work with ammonium salts as substrates, and you can see some of the performance here. Um, truth be told, these are conversions, not isolated yields, but I think that, again, the reactions here are, are exemplified by the fact that they're quite clean, and, and what we see is, is product and, and starting material.
Uh, next slide, uh, please. Um, we can, in fact, now start to oxidize um, these uh, brominated and tosylated um, propane derivatives, and uh, that allows us to develop now what is effectively a single step uh, or single flask method for doing an amination and then cyclizing to form azetidine uh, heterocycles, which um, have some value in, in pharmaceutical synthesis, as, uh, as Matt was indicating in the previous talk. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, just to try and wrap things up here in the last couple of minutes, I mean, we have, of course, become very interested in understanding the differential performance of T-butyl nitrile as a solvent versus the other solvents that we've used traditionally, isopropyl acetate, methylene chloride, and even acetonitrile. I think it's fair to say that T-butyl nitrile and acetonitrile have similar donating strength, and that's really captured by the sort of UV, spectro UV visible spectroscopy. If you look at the, the shift of this pi star to sigma star transition, they differ by maybe 10 wave numbers. That is the purple and the blue curve. And that's really a reflection, again, of the sigma donating strength of the nitrile ligand. And I think it's fair to say that there's, there's very, very slight, slight difference there. So we've started doing um, some UV vis studies to look at reaction kinetics. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is fairly preliminary data, and I think there's still many more questions here than there are answers, but, but it, it does appear that at least initially the rate of oxidation of the, of the rhodium nitrine to the 2,3 dimer, which is what we're, we're really monitoring the rate of formation of the 2,3 dimer, the red species, is in fact a little bit slower in T-butyl nitrile than acetonitrile um, or isopropyl acetate. Uh, I think the next slide, though, is, is really much more definitive as we think about the possibility of the 2,2 rhodium nitrine um, performing H-atom abstraction, as we had seen or as the DESI experiments had suggested to us. What we see is a rather profound in, improvement in turnover number when we switch from methylene chloride to deuterated methylene chloride, or for that matter, from acetonitrile to deuterated acetonitrile. Uh, what is interesting is that benzonitrile is not as good as t-butyl nitrile if you believe that H-atom abstraction of solvent is a problem. But, you know, I would say that um, uh, there may be other reasons why benzonitrile is not as good a solvent as t-butyl nitrile. I wouldn't split hairs over, over maybe 5% difference either. But um, I, I think that, you know, we see this as evidence that in, indeed H-atom abstraction of solvent is, is certainly one pathway by which... Um, these reactions arrest. And so in the final data slide, um, uh, what we've tried to do, and this has been also very challenging, is to actually determine what is the state or the fate of the, the, the catalyst over the course of the reaction. What we've been able to do by making a fluorinated version of rhodium ESP is to be able to sort of monitor these reactions by fluorine NMR. And what I'm showing you is the sort of the fluorine signal for the pure complex in T-butyl nitrile and acetyl nitrile. And what we see, and this is just now the next slide, is, the, is from the spent reaction mixture, um, we see that in fact the, the rhodium ESP is still intact, at least to the extent that 30% of the starting complex is still intact in the T-butyl nitrile at the end of, of a one hour reaction cycle. Whereas in the acetyl nitrile um, solvent, there is evidently no ESP left, um, but only free ligand can be observed. So the complex appears to have been completely dissociated. And this is really uh, intriguing to us. It, it, it raises many more questions than it does answers at this point. We, we can confirm that indeed what we're seeing here um, is, is in fact both complex and ligand by simply spiking in pure samples of those, of those materials. But, um, we feel uh, we're pretty excited to have this type of, of fluorinated ESP probe in hand as a way of, again, uh, now tracking the catalyst sort of speciation um, as a function of, of the reaction time course. So um, final slide is just to conclude. Um, I think what has been certainly a, a, a case all along with this research is that something that started out as a very simple idea 15 years ago as uh, manifest into a much more complicated um, reaction methods problem and certainly a much more complicated uh, mechanistic uh, morass. And uh, every time I personally think we've sort of reached a glass ceiling, we discover something new. And, and I think right now we, we feel pretty optimistic that with some of the more recent insights, um, 
we're going to be able to push this chemistry further and continue to improve this inter molecular amination chemistry uh, going forward. And ideally, uh, next slide, please, um, start to find new rhodium complexes uh, beyond ESP where we can use the complex itself or the ligand environment itself to really control selectivity in, um, as our substrates become more and more complicated. Uh, to our mind, and I, I think it's fair to say that Hugh and I share a common bond here, um, the, the holy grail for this kind of atom transfer CH oxidation is really having reagent or catalyst control over, over selectivity. And, um, and I think that uh, some of the work that we've done recently takes a, a step forward in, in that direction. Um, so a uh, final slide is just to acknowledge um, all of the people who have worked on amination uh, over the course of many years now. The folks whose names are highlighted in red, Kristen Fiore, David Zalatan, Jennifer Roizen, James Mack, Nick Chiappini, have all contributed to today's talk. And I think given the hour, I'll just um, thank them um, all for their efforts. Uh, the many collaborators we've been fortunate to engage with, um, including a few groups that I didn't get a chance to, to call out uh, explicitly. and uh, of course, uh, the center and Novartis and Pfizer um, for uh, support. Um, the final slide uh, is just my way of uh, acknowledging Hugh uh, Davis for um, the vision and the leadership to really put together what has been an incredible program, uh, not just for me personally, but for certainly for my coworkers, uh, both students and postdocs, and the opportunity to engage with so many interesting people across the United States in a way that I, I think has really transformed um, certainly the way we're doing, we're doing science uh, these days. So uh, thank uh, Hugh for all of his efforts uh, and uh, for the opportunity to um, speak with you today. And thank you all for staying online.